Goldman Sachs economic forecast. What's next for the economy in Q2? Near all-time highs on U.S. equity indices and the pullback risk. Finally, Coinbase, Energy, and Chinese tech stocks. Welcome back, Tom Thornton. Ash, how are you? I'm doing great. I know we've been talking a lot offline. We've got a tremendous amount to cover here. Let's get started with just a general 50,000-foot overview on markets and your thoughts. Okay, well, let's start with the equity markets. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, you know, real pent up demand to be buying stocks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the volume has been really, really light. Uh, the, it, this in April, uh, I think it's just a seller's strike. And if you look at the intra month chart, we had a really strong two weeks up, and then we've gone sideways. And Market sentiment remains extreme if you look at any of the polls, uh, especially investors' intelligence, which comes out tomorrow, and I'll be talking about it. Um, that's been extreme. The daily sentiment index has been extreme. Um, and the other thing that I'm seeing right now, which is really sort of unique, um, I talk a lot about DeMarc indicators, and I've used DeMarc indicators for 20 years. Uh, and I screen every day within the S&P 500 and other markets of how many exhaustion signals we're getting. Now, we've had a bunch on the daily. A lot of the dailies have just been run over and they haven't worked. But what is happening now, since this trend has been so long, now we're seeing a very, very large number of weekly ex ex exhaustion signals, the sequential and the combo cell countdown 13s. That has more intermediate term implications uh, happening right now. And then I think we were on, you know, earlier in the month, and I was talking about uh, interest rates um, would pause. Uh, we hit about 175 on the 10 year and yields backed off. It could have been due that the Japanese could come back and, and buy US treasuries, uh, could be positioning where. A lot of people were set up short and they had to cover, uh, thus yields dropped. Now, today we actually saw a little bit of a rise back over 161, 162, uh, almost 160, 1.63%, nearly there, a uh, rather large move. And that could start to scare the equity market as it did before. Now, I, I'm looking at upside targets over 2%, 2.5% on the 10-year. And that's something that when I showed targets of 175 earlier in the year, I, I didn't really get a lot of attention. But now, if we do go over the recent highs in the, let's say, the 10-year yield at, at 175, uh, then I think people are going to start to notice. So my view right now is we've had a big move up at the beginning of April. We've gone sideways with a chop. Earnings are coming out. People aren't getting rewarded uh, for the good beats that are happening. And expectations are super, super high. So if we're not getting the upside after earnings, after beating earnings so so much, uh, I think that that's telling. Um, and yeah. I'm looking right now, Google's up 4% or Alphabet is up 4%. Uh, big numbers there. And I, I think that they just keep crushing it. Yeah, massive numbers. I, I think it was it uh, was it revenue report growing up uh, 35 percent or something quarter over yeah, quarter. Just, they just print money, print yeah. money. There's so much there, Tom, to unpack. Uh, let's go back to the thing that you said at the beginning that I thought was really interesting, which was the volume on this market. Talk a little bit about the context for the thinness of this market for people who don't follow these indicators as closely as you do. Well, one of the things that when you see light volume. Uh, that that typically occurs towards a wave five type of move. And we've had five waves, Elliott waves on the upside. And I, I honestly think that it's just we're running out of money to push this any higher. And the other thing is we are going higher. Uh, that's partly because sellers have just stopped selling. I mean, why sell? I mean, motivating motivating a seller only happens when you see declines and they get fearful of 
losing profits or taking losses if they recently bought. So we're not going to get big volume uh, here, but if we do move down 5% or my view is that it could be, you know, 10% sell in May, go away. It just might work this year. Uh, we'll see, but everything's lining up to where everything is very, very peaky. And I think right now it's, we've had a good start to the year. And if you're not taking some profits and holding some cash and diversifying into some other places, um, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You know, the other thing that reminds me of is something that you said right at the end, which is this notion uh, that you see stocks with big beats not being rewarded for it. And that potentially, potentially starts to look a little toppy. Talk a little bit about that mechanism, why it happens uh, and what it may be signaling. I think it's partly because uh, people are positioned already super long in these in these names, and and the financials were a really good example because they, they came out with a really big beats, and they beat uh, I, I think overall uh, one of the larger components of of growth this quarter, and everything was running up into numbers, and wham, they they came out good numbers, not a lot of loan growth. But still, they sold off. And I think that people were just very much positioned long uh, in the market. And that's probably why you've seen some of the names that have beat numbers uh, not really do it. I mean, let's say, I mean, I'm looking at Microsoft. Hang on. Microsoft, breaking news, is down 3.5%. That's a super crowded name really hard to go wrong in this but they tend to sell off after earnings and that could happen with some other larger tech names um, we'll see later this week it's going to be a very busy week yeah and that brings us to something else that we touched on uh in the very beginning which was the goldman sachs economic forecast i think we have the chart loaded up uh, we can run it on the screen talk to this explain what we're looking at right now Okay, I, I've been staring at this chart for two days, and I put it on my note today because I really th I, th I thought a lot about it. And you've had some sell side calls. Uh, Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley's been saying something like this, um, and then Goldman Sachs put this out. Basically, Q2 is going to be as good as it gets for GDP growth uh, quarter over quarter, uh, year over year. Uh, it's not going to. It's going to still it'll still beat. Um, in a big way, but I think people are going to start to look at this and see, uh, you know, the the economic the economic uh, backdrop in the U.S. is super super strong right now. But it's not necessarily a typical recovery because nobody's really seen a pandemic before, and nobody's really seen this type of quick unemployment drop uh, without necessarily a recession. Uh, and I. I you know, I'd say, look, this is a pandemic pullback um, with with unemployment uh, spiking. But now you're starting to see those people come back to work. And I think you're going to see in the next three, three to four months, really, really strong employment numbers. And that's not necessarily uh, new jobs being created, but that's people going back to work. And this whole thing about with what Goldman's saying is, that we're going to see quarter over quarter declines in GDP. Now, they'll still be really, really strong, but it, eventually, uh, and this is part of my theme, it's going to get back to normal. We're going to be back in this normal place, and when we get there, which could be a quarter or two away, we're also going to have the prospect of higher taxes. Uh, we're going to have... Um, Capital gains, we're going to be looking at going up, um, which I, I don't think it's going to be 40%, but I think it's going to be somewhere around 30, 35 at the most. They're going to work something out. But still, that's an increase, and I don't think people like will like that at all. And you'll start to see that job growth uh, or job numbers start to, to level off as well. Right. Now you have a lot – one thing that's really important is you have a lot of companies on their conference calls talking about they can't find workers to hire. And part of the reason 
could be they're not paying them enough. So they have to step out of their comfort zone of what they want to pay people and bump it up to hire the best people they can. And they're competing with the government, which is still paying out uh, a lot in unemployment benefits. So that's something I'm watching. The last thing on this, in the data with all the regional ISMs or, or PMIs, there, there's been this huge move in prices paid. So you've had this giant move in commodity prices, semiconductors, there's a shortage. We know all about that. That's very clear. Lumber's gone crazy, corn, everything's just gone parabolic. That's also going to start to wane. And I did get some DeMarc signals on the daily and weekly on lumber and corn this week. And we'll see if those signals can exhaust that trend or, or signal an exhaustion of the trend. But those are really, really parabolic type moves that shouldn't be able to sustain. And those that price is paid, will start to come down. People are paying up for goods to keep their businesses running. That's the bottom line. And that will top out probably with Goldman Sachs' call in the second quarter. Yeah. Well, that's such an insightful analysis. So you've got the macro on the one hand, the micro, what's happening in markets right now, seeing some of that inflation coming in uh, to commodities prices, um, you know, the specter of wage push inflation hanging out there. You know, my take on that Goldman chart, and I've been studying it since you sent it, is it's interesting to me, two things that are noteworthy. Uh, first, the subpar growth as you get out uh, to the edge of the curve there in uh, Q4 22, coming in at 1.5 or 1.3 percent. And the second is that Goldman is above consensus estimates pretty considerably uh, for Q2 21, 8.1 versus 10.5. But gradually, as you hit out to Q2 22, that starts to sink and their forecast is below consensus. Right. And and let's... Um you know, to kind of complete this, uh, I, I thought about, well, what's the thing that we all have to worry about? And it's the Fed. And I've been saying that, um, I, I said this earlier in the month, that the Fed heads are, you know, the governors and and maybe even Powell or uh, Clarita will say that uh, they'll start to, as they said, start thinking about thinking of perhaps changing policy. And they're going to see this data and it's going to be just unbelievably good. I mean, you look at Ed Hyman on his from ISI on his video calls and he does this. He's like I can't believe this type of, you know, this data. And he's an economist that's seen so many different markets, but he's seeing this just go straight up and it's mm. so strong. The Fed's going to have to do something and I think the interesting thing is they will probably go in in June and say here we're going to taper, I mean, even if it's a little, you know, $10 billion or something, th that's going to have the market start to, you know, get concerned a little bit. If they go big, it'll be a, a, a much bigger thing, but I don't think they will. They'll do it in dribs and drabs. But here's the problem. As that GDP starts going down and the growth starts going down, they're going to start tapering into that slowdown. And they just could, they might just be behind the curve on this. And I know everybody's going to say, oh no, the Fed can't, you know, do anything. I'm not saying tighten, but I'm just saying taper. Uh, right. Some of the, it's just egregious of uh, how much they're, they're buying. And the other thing that's interesting on yields, on the rates going up, there's so much issuance coming this year and really towards the second half of the year to pay for all this. And the Fed's not going to be buying that uh, the, the, that issuance. And so I'm curious to know who's going to buy it and at what, at what where, where rate's going to be uh, to entice those people. So that's just all stuff swirling around my head. And that's what's been with what I'm debating in my head all, all day. Yeah, so much there in these very complicated times. Uh, you know, not talking about... Uh, about tightening, but reducing the rate uh, at which the balance sheet is expanding in your view. And that naturally brings up, I guess it's the $20 trillion question. Tommy, when are you going to start worrying about worrying about inflation? You, you know, you, you hear a lot of 
I, I hear both sides of it. And I know some people that are that are seeing the other side of this and they're calling they're they're saying, you know, we're gonna see deflation. I also have, you know, friends like uh, Julian Brigden who is just like about ready to like scream. Uh, he sees super high inflation. And part right. of it is is, you know, uh, all the data he's watching and and it's they're they're out of their mind, you know, oh my God, this is gonna be so inflationary. But I think it's a little of both, and I think you're going to see this. It's going to be more transitory. So I think you're going to see this. This we've, well, we've seen a lot of it already, but I think it's going to be maybe towards the second half of this year we're going to start to see inflation that spike come back a little bit or or level off. That would be that would be fine. But uh, you know, the Fed wants wants it hot, and they're getting it hot, and you know they're going to. I don't know. They're going to figure out what they're going to do if uh, this inflation number gets a little out of hand. The worry that I have and and people should watch is the rate of change on rates. If rates start to really rise quickly, that is going to spook the markets more than just a gradual rise. So it's an unruly type move that will be the the concern that that we have to watch for. Yeah. You know, Tommy, you've been doing this for a very long time, watching these markets. And it's interesting. I can't remember a time where I heard so much speculation uh, about price stability on both sides of the spectrum, hearing people screaming about the risk of inflation, uh, other folks talking about the potential for a deflationary spiral. It's a weird time. Yeah. I mean, it, we're living in a very weird, uh, weird world. And um, I think that it's it's really unprecedented and you know back a year ago last march when everything was falling apart you know the, all my indicators were basically i had tons of demark buy signals and i was like mm. you know trying to tell people to buy into a pandemic was just you know nobody wanted to hear it market sentiment was at 4% bulls i actually screen grabbed the CNN fear and greed when it hit 1% bulls. Mm. And I looked at that and I said, well, it, it can't get much worse than this. So we've got all these signals and everything's lining up. So let's get in there and buy. Now I bought and I made great profits and I was thrilled to make 50% on Zillow, but it went up 200%. I, sorry, I did not get that right. 50% <laughs> was nice on a lot of things, but it's just been wild. It's been a wild year. Yeah. You know, we teased it at the top of the show, Coinbase Energy and Chinese tech stocks. I know you have some insights there. What are you thinking about? Okay. So last we or last time I was on, I mentioned I was going to be buying Coinbase. Um, I actually, their, their earnings were leaking out of what their revenues were and how many new subscribers. And it's just like, it's incredible growth. And I like Coinbase um, over the next two to three quarters. And the reason I like it is because they continue to have just a, a domination in the market uh, of for crypto trading, as as you know, because Ash, you're the you know the prince of crypto. Um, Raul's the king of crypto on Re Real Vision. Um, but I, I like that I like their margins of what they have now. Guess what's coming in the next few quarters? JV Morgan's going to have it. Goldman's going to have it. Um, everybody's going to have some sort of crypto trading, and they're going to undercut Coinbase's high margins, and that will slow things down. But when I told people I was buying Coinbase on Twitter, and I bought a, on the first day, I I paid. A little high and a little low, about one percent, and I want to get to three percent. So I haven't bought any more. My average is around three fifty. It's okay, but the way I see it is this is short bait, and short bait is like everything you see on Tesla. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to short Tesla because the valuation makes no sense. Elon Musk is crazy, um, <laughs> you know, compared to you know. There's just, I can go on and on about that, but short bait is what is ha going to happen with Coinbase. 
And, you know, everybody was talking about, oh, the CEO and the CFO sold, you know, 95% of their current holdings the first day. And I would say, okay, there's two ways of looking at it. The, all, the, it could be bad, like, oh, my God, they, they know something that, that we don't know. Uh, I think that they were just, you know, being greedy and took everything they could and know that it, the stock was going to come down. But I will say this, on a direct listing, you don't have a lockup. So if they actually sold 20% of their holdings, they might have 30% that they can unlock in six months. So we don't have an unlock situation to worry about and i'm just waiting for the next uh short interest came out yesterday i'm waiting for the next two weeks and we'll see what coinbase's uh short uh positions look like and i'm expecting it to be a really really high number and i i want them to report and then we're going to see a short squeeze and if i'm wrong i don't you know i'm still a fairly small position in in this but it's a it's a the picks and shovels of the gold rush for crypto, in my opinion. Yeah, it's an intriguing point about uh, Coinbase and uh, J.P. Morgan. Obviously, these are two very different uh, types of mentalities for investors. Two very different types of products. I think it's coming out of uh, J.P. Morgan's private bank. It's going to be an actively managed fund. Uh, so something very different than retail investors uh, who are going to jump in uh, and buy for themselves for their own account, manage their own wallets potentially. Uh, at Coinbase, but it, it just suggests you, well, two things for me at least. Number one, it's the breadth of the space, just how many different products, audiences, types of products, types of objectives that you have. And secondly, uh, wow, what an about face uh, from Mr. Diamond. Yeah, I, look, I think, I think crypto is going to stay. Uh, some of the smaller coins will probably fade away, uh, but I, I, I think you're, you're seeing great moves in Ethereum. Um, I like actually Ethereum more than I do like uh, Bitcoin at this place, uh, partly because of the useful utility of Ethereum. And again, I'm not the expert. Uh, you're the prince of of crypto. So uh, anyway, I I I like I like Coinbase. I'm gonna you know try and build a three percent position into some weakness and try and get a good average, and then let's see where they go over the next couple quarters. Yeah. And to shift gears here into Chinese tech stocks, this is such an intriguing uh, area for me. I'm fascinated by the companies. I'm fascinated by what they're doing there. Uh, for people like me who aren't following this market as closely as you are, give us a sense of the overall structure, where it is, the key names, and why you find it interesting from an investable perspective. Right. So I, basically, the way I am playing this group uh, I'm buying. I bought KWeb, KWeb, which is the Chinese uh, internet ETF. I bought Alibaba, Baidu, uh, JD, and those are really easily, you know, brand name uh, companies in in China. They've had a really good pullback, as has the Shanghai and uh, uh, Hong Kong. They've pulled back, so I, I'm looking for places to exploit some long ideas. And all of those uh, that I just mentioned had to mark by 13, so by countdown 13. So they were exhausted on the downside, and that's what intrigued me. Another thing that was really interesting is that at the highs of those, uh, you know, K-Web and the others just a few months ago, there was tons of call buying. And that was speculators, you know, betting on it going higher. And right now, we've seen a lot of put buying in mm. there. So it's just the same thing as, you know, short squeeze, long squeeze. But I think with all those put buyers, uh, we could see a squeeze higher. And it's starting. Uh, it's K-Web's at 78. I bought it last week, and it's starting to work. I think that it could go to about $90, uh, maybe higher. It, it hit 100 um, a few months ago, and I, I think that... Uh, they're pretty consistent. The one thing I will say is, of course, uh, Jack Ma is probably, you know, in some, you know, concentration camp in China being held against his will. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, but they're going to do a lot with uh, the Chinese government's going to nationalize, I think, 
ant group of the Alipay portion, and Jack Ma is going to be phased out, and these are becoming more nationalized. And so I, I think that you're going to see those stocks. Uh, we the, actually the the Chinese uh, latest uh, comments were not as uh, uh, dark as some people thought, with which is what could have happened with all Alibaba. Uh, mm. So I think you're seeing a bounce from there. So I'm I'm exploiting some areas on the long side. I think this is a pretty easy, uh, long idea. It's pulled back. You know, I think I think that's where we want to be. Tom, let me ask you something. You raised this question about the specter of nationalization. Uh, how do you even think about what happens to the shareholders? What happens to Chinese capital markets? Uh, what happens to uh, China currency? I mean, that's a significant. Uh, thing I have just am curious what your basic framework is for even beginning to think about something uh, of that magnitude. In China, they can do whatever they want to the companies, and you know they know that there's a significant amount of monopoly power that uh, Alibaba has, and uh, AliPay and Ant Group uh, had just become so so big, and it was circumventing some of the normal banking uh, procedures and, and rules. Right. And that's why they, they just said, nope, sorry, it's not going to happen. You know, they were going to rush out an IPO. And I, I will tell you this. Um, I know some people that are shareholders of Ant Group and on the, they bought it through, you know, private, private uh, sales uh, over the last couple of years. They're not happy about this. They're very, very upset. And mm. years back, I was fortunate enough to uh, be a part of a group. Uh, I connected people and bought into Alibaba uh, before they went public. I think it was like fifteen dollars, and I helped mm. some friends, you know, with fifty million dollars. Not mine, but you know, rich friends, deep pocket hedge fund people. They crushed it. Mm. But they're not on on Ant Financial. They're they're really very, very frustrated because they thought this was going to be just, you know, another grand slam. Fascinating. Such an interesting space. Tom, one thing we haven't covered yet is energy. I know that you were buying in the fall, you sold, now you're optimistic, you're bullish again, buying back in. What are your thoughts on energy markets? I, you're right. I, I bought in October and sold uh, this year. Really, I think energy is the most unloved sector in the market and it's also perhaps the best reopening play out there uh, because if everything reopens it's going to take energy uh, get planes flying it's going to take crude you get people back in offices it's going to take uh, natural gas to for the the air conditioners I, everything i i see um happening in the energy space uh, is really appealing. And a lot of the companies that I like, and I tend to like the larger companies and the drillers, uh, they're actually, they've done a lot of work over the last couple of years of really painful work to reinvent themselves, to streamline their businesses. They've gotten rid of certain businesses that were unproductive for them and Schlumberger and, and even Halliburton had uh, pretty decent earnings. Uh, and this, I mean, they were fine. Uh, but what was really encouraging were the conference calls because the management sounds very, very bullish of, of what's to come in the future. And if these companies are running lean, uh, I think that when the economy really turns on, uh, they're going to do very, very well. But I'll tell you this. The OIH, the oil drillers, is down 27% from its recent peak. Uh, mm. XLE is down 15% from its recent peak. Those pullbacks are significant and enough for me to start to look at them again. And I think they're going to continue to go up. I think they're going to surpass the recent highs. And I'm I'm not necessarily saying oh the bottom is you know clearly here because if the equity markets do sell off these will get murdered as well, but I just want to I started buying them uh, yesterday and I'm going to start looking uh, to add to them uh, with some individual names. So I bought XLE, o, uh, XOP, and OIH 
and one percent positions in, in all three. Mm. I'll probably build those up to three percent uh, each, and I want to have about a fifteen percent weighting in the energy markets. Uh, that's that's really my core view. And I, I feel really strong too about some of the really big ones, the Exxon's, uh, Chevron's. Uh, I, I think they're they're doing things right now that um, they're running lean. And remember, Exxon was thrown out of the Dow at the absolute low. Hmm. I think it's going to be really uh, interesting to see uh, them them come back because a lot of times when they get kicked out of the Dow. Uh, they tend to uh, rebound and uh, do pretty well. So it's, uh, in my opinion, I like the energy group uh, as a reopening play. Yeah. Well, you had a great trade there with some really impressive timing coming out from uh, Oct 20 to about, uh, it looks like uh, early March, 50% run up on WTI. Yeah. it's and, and there are a lot of the names in the energy names that really did extraordinary. Uh, Occidental was, was, 100%. Uh, it's actually up even more from there now. And there's a, a bunch that I think that have pulled back enough to where you can buy them and and sit tight for the next couple of quarters. And I think that that's going to be a, a real tell. Normally, the seasonality for energy stocks starts in January, which it, it did start in January. And then in May, it starts to peter out. But I think this is going to be a different year with seasonality because everything's reopening. And I, I, I think people are going to say, oh, you know, how many people do you know that want to travel? Uh, I've taken two trips. Uh, the airports are really people are getting, you know, moving in or, or moving uh, uh, or looking to, you know, take trips uh, this summer. I, I personally think it's going to be a complete madhouse uh at some vacation spots where i'll, I'll stay home um, <laughs> and watch my energy stocks <laughs> tom it's always such a pleasure to have you on the show great stuff today we've covered a lot of ground what would you like to leave our subscribers with uh, i think everybody should just think about the strong gains that we've had so far uh this year uh, reallocate into some some other places. Uh, have some cash if this sell in May does happen. You know, maybe May mid May. Uh, I think you could see a 10 to 20 percent pullback in the markets, and that would only bring us back to where we were last fall. And I think that would be a very healthy move. It'd probably scare the you know the, the, the hell out of people, but that would be actually a really good opportunity to you know, get there and get really a little bit longer um, in this market. And and I'm finding shorts out there uh, with all the sell demark, the demark sell signals. So I, I think mm -hmm. right now it's not an easy time to say, I'm going to put fresh money to work. It's a good time to say, I'm going to take some off the table. Yeah. As always, Tom, always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Ash. Tom Thornton, thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching everyone.